Uh, so growing up as a, as a kid, I was a pretty anxious kid. I got nervous a lot. And one of the places where that really came out was when I went to camp. Um, I loved camp and I hated camp all at the same time. Camp was great because I was an, I'm, an ext- I'm an extrovert, right? And so there's always people at camp. And you can talk to people and see people and there's all the people you could ever want. But it was also kind of the worst week of my life because I was terribly, terribly homesick. I mean, just terribly homesick. And I remember laying in bed at camp and counting down and being like, there's only five more nights to go. You know, I just have to live through these five nights and I'm going to make it. And, and as the week went on, it got better, not because I got more used to camp, but because I was like, there's only two more nights to go. You know, like the end is in sight. I was worried. Uh, I was homesick and I was worried. I, I was worried that somehow my parents who are kind, loving, compassionate people, excellent parents, people who have always provided for me and taken care of me would somehow over the course of the five days that I was at camp, forget about the previous eight years of my life and just forget that I was there. Like I was just, I was worried that they wouldn't come get me. And so I would send them letters, right? And the letter, and I asked my mom this week, I was like, do you remember the letters I sent you from camp? And she's like, they were terrible right? Because the letters would say things like, dear mom and dad, I am so homesick. I hate camp. I want to come home. Please come home. Please come get me right now. And they would always end with this. Do not forget me on Saturday at 10 o'clock. Do not be late. Be here Saturday at 10 o'clock. I said, mom, did you keep any of those letters? She said, heavens, no. They were just awful. (laughs) That feeling of homesickness of yearning and longing for something different than what you have is a feeling that we all know, isn't it? Sometimes there's this sense that the place that we're at, the place that we live in, the place that we're experiencing is not the place we wanna stay. And we can't help but look towards the next thing and the next thing. Jeremiah is writing to some homesick people. You see, the people of God, the Israelites, were in exile. They had been drugged off to Babylon where they were living their life, where they had been uh, put in a place that wasn't their home, surrounded by people that weren't their families. This was not the life that they had thought was gonna happen. They had been consistently and radically unfaithful to God's word. They had broken covenant, they had forgotten God, they had worshiped idols, they had done their own thing, and eventually God says, all right, you need need to time out, right? You need to remember that there's a different kind of life. And so they are taken into exile. God says that God allows them to be taken into exile, and they live as strangers in a foreign land, and they hate it. They keep yearning and longing for for what they know and what they knew. They long for the old ways. They long to be brought back to the places that they were from. They are deeply, deeply homesick. And that's when Jeremiah writes them this letter. Most scholars think that while Jeremiah writes them this letter, there was another prophet who was writing them and telling them, just hang on a little more. God's coming for you. Just hang on a little more. You're going to be freed from this, from this exile. You're going to be freed and brought back. And yet the letter Jeremiah writes doesn't say that, does it? Jeremiah writes them a letter and says, settle down. You're in this for the long haul. Build houses. Have children. Plant gardens. Because you're not going anywhere. And for people that are deeply homesick and longing for something different, for people who do not want to be at the place where they are, this doesn't seem like good news. For people who face uncertainty and anxiety and unknown, this seems like difficult news. Have you ever lived in that place? In a season of uncertainty and anxiety, in a season of the unknown? Have you ever lived in the place where you're so ready for the next thing that it's hard to be present in the place where you are, where you long for the next step and it's hard to live in the moment that you're experiencing? In in many ways, the letter that the people receive is a word of hope, even if it doesn't seem like it on the surface. Because one of the things that reminds the people is that they have not been forgotten. You see, in the ancient Near East, gods were were thought to be pretty localized. And so it it was thought that the boundaries of of a land were also the boundaries of the God that ruled over it. And for the Israelites, God was in the temple. And if you weren't at the temple, if you weren't in Jerusalem, there was some question about whether God had any say. 
So when Jeremiah writes the letter to the people, he's reminding them, the God that has sent you there has not forgotten you. The God who has sent you into exile has not left you. What, God, what Jeremiah is reminding the people right off the bat is that the God that they serve, the God that they worship, is not localized. The God that they serve and worship is not contained. In fact, the God that they serve and worship is powerful and mighty over all things and in all places. In the midst of their uncertainty and anxiety, in the midst of their fear and homesickness, in the midst of their struggle and loss, they have not been forgotten. They continue to hear the word of the Lord that's been given to them that sustains them and keeps them in uncertain times. As you are facing uncertain times, in those moments in life where you feel like you need to move to the next place, in those moments in life where you're not sure you can make it in the place where you are, may you know the voice of God that says, I rule and reign over all that too. Over the chaos and the uncertainty, over the anxiety and the fear, even in the midst of that, I am with you. And I have not forgotten you. It is a word of hope. It is a word that reminds us that we are not alone. It is a word that reminds us that even in the moments of challenge, we have not been abandoned. So the word comes, and it begins to to lay out for them this way of being. And, And Jeremiah says, in the midst of this moment, in the midst of this moment where you are on the on the edges and in the place of uncertainty, get used to it. Settle down. Build houses, plant gardens, have kids. May your kids have kids. You're in this for the long haul. God is with you, but God is not coming Saturday morning at 10 a.m. God's timing is different than ours. God's timing doesn't work in the same ways that ours does. So, Jeremiah says, be where you are. Bloom where you're planted. Live in this moment. Jeremiah's invitation to us to live in the moment is one that we can hold on to and handle, isn't it? Because particularly if you start to read the beginning of Jeremiah's call to the people, we can make sense of it, right? Jeremiah says to the people, build houses. And we think, well, of course, they need houses. People need places to live. Okay. And then Jeremiah says, plant gardens. And we say, well, yeah, that makes sense. People need food. They need sustenance. They can handle this. Jeremiah says, get married. And well, this starts to get a little more difficult, marrying people that are not like you, but, but people need relationship and connection. And oh, okay, we can work with this. And then Jeremiah says to the people, seek the welfare of the city and pray to the Lord on their behalf. And I can imagine when the people hear that for the first time, they say, what? Seek the welfare of the city? Seek the welfare of the people who are my enemies? Seek the welfare of the people who have have dragged us into exile? What? Seek the welfare and pray for the people that have put us in this place that we don't want to be? Suddenly there is this call to love our enemies that is huge and significant and countercultural and radical. There is this call to care for the place that we live, even if it's not the place we want to be. Suddenly the call to be invested in our community is maybe not what we expected because we realize the houses that we build and the gardens that we plant and the relationships we invest in are not for us. They are for the benefit of the other. We are not to build houses and gate them off and to build gardens and to hoard the food or to care for the community in which we live. And it is a word of challenge. Sometimes that's a word of challenge to us. Uh, Because there are some of us that maybe have lived in this community all of our lives. You've lived here a long time and the community around you has changed and things don't look like it used to and it becomes easy just to say there's not much I can do about it and step out. There are some of you that are only going to live in Morgantown a short time, and you say to seek the welfare of the city doesn't make any sense. This is just transitional. I'm just moving through. This isn't a place that I need to invest. But it, God's call to the exiles and God's call to us isn't based on how long we've lived in a place or not lived in a place. God's call to the exiles and God's call to us is to invest deeply in the community in which we live, to learn to care for the people around us, to allow God to break our hearts for our neighbors and for the the people who live close by. The call that God gives us is to begin to ask the question, what can we do to make our community look a little more like heaven? That's the question I've heard over and over this week. What can we do as Suncrest United Methodist Church? What can we do as the people called by God who gather here to make Morgantown look a little more like heaven? 
Because if Morgantown started to look like heaven, it would mean that there were no, lon- no, no more lonely people. It would mean that there are no more hungry people. It would mean that there are, are no more addicted people. If Morgantown started to look a little bit more like heaven, it would mean that people who are far, who are far off would be brought in. It would mean that people who are hurting would experience the healing and hope that God has to offer. If Morgantown started to look a little a bit more like heaven, it would mean that people who didn't have homes would find places to live. It would look radically different than what we know. So what is it for us, church? What can we do to make Morgantown look a little more like heaven? What can we do to learn to invest in our community, to care for the people around us, to invite God to break our hearts that we might experience and see the needs that people have and do what we can to meet them? What would it look like to say we're gonna partner and invest our time and our talent and our money? What would it look like for us as the church to say we wanna sow an investment into the neighborhoods around us, into the students around us, into the people around us in such a way that lives are changed. We're gonna expect to invest in the other and not have them invest in us. That's not always the way we think. As I thought about this sermon, I kept thinking about my friend Brian. Uh, Brian was a student here for, uh, for four years. And when Brian first came, I sat down with him. He was a freshman. And I said, are you excited to come to WVU? And he said, nope, it's my backup. And, and for the first several months and weeks that we would talk, I would say, how do you like Morgantown? I don't like it at all. I'm ready to go somewhere else. I said, well, Ryan, you're here. He says, I know, God's put me here, but this is not where I want to be. I said, okay. So we'd talk more and more. At the end of the four years that Brian was here, he had built relationships with people and connected with people. He had led mentoring programs and engaged with youth in our community. He had invested his life in a place that he wasn't going to stay and made a difference. It wasn't the plan he had, but if you're willing to invest in the place that you are, God does great work. Church, what if what if something happened and, and our building here on the corner didn't exist anymore? It just was gone. Would anybody miss us? Would anybody in the community know that we were missing? Have we invested enough and cared enough and, and pursued the welfare of the city enough that people would notice? I don't know how to do this. I don't know what it looks like. I wish I could give you some three-step plan that says do this and this and this and that'll be enough. I don't have that. Here's what I have. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for our community. Pray for the students. Pray for the people that surround you. Pray, pray, pray. And say, God, show me how I can make a difference. Show me how I can make a change. Show me how I can be part of this work because I believe that God is planting in you and in me this deep dream, this deep hope and longing. I believe that God is planting in us as a church this desire to see something new brought forth. I believe that God is working in us in this powerful way to birth a new movement that's gonna make Morgantown look a little more like heaven. I don't know what it looks like, but I think together we probably do. If we dream God's dream and hear God's call, and are willing to invest our time and our talent and our energy and our life in our community, I think God will bless that. So what, what is God calling you to do? What is God calling us to do together that we might make Morgantown look a little more like heaven, that we might invest in the place that we are, that we might be dealers of hope and good news who offer to those around us the life that Jesus has to give? That's the question. May we seek and pray together to find the answer.